so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is still Francesco Petroccione, and I'm the interim director of, uh, of, of NITEX. Uh, this afternoon, um, it is a great pleasure to introduce you, to you uh, Dr. Lorraine uh, Jante. I hope I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> Lorraine. Uh, Lorraine is a postdoctoral, postdoctoral fellow at the moment at, uh, at Ames in Wilsonberg and at the same time in the School of Data Science and Computational Thinking at the University of, of, of Stellenbosch. <clears throat> uh, as the name sort of indicates, she studied in, in, in Toulouse, yeah? um, where she graduated as an agricultural engineer. <clears throat> yeah? And um, after that, she started a PhD at the CNRS um, in ecology. Yeah? And, uh, and during that time, she discovered uh, her love for deep learning and, uh, and to apply it to, <clears throat> to questions related to, uh, to wildlife. Yeah, since a, a year or so, she's or probably less than a year, I don't remember, she's, she's now based at, uh, at Ames in South Africa. Yeah? In 2020, uh, Lorraine was awarded uh, one of the very prestigious L'Oreal UNESCO uh, for, uh, for Women in Science. Uh, awards, yeah. So we are very uh, happy to to have you with us, uh, Lorraine. Yeah. Uh, so maybe while Lorraine uh, um, starts sharing her, her presentation, uh, just a, the usual reminder to please use the Q and A for questions, or maybe after the talk, just raise your uh, your hand. <clears throat> and doc, and Professor, sorry, sorry <laughs> Professor Sinaiski, who kindly acts as co-host uh, every time, just to make sure that uh, everything runs smoothly, will monitor the Q&A uh, so that uh, Lorraine doesn't have to stress with that. Yeah? After the talk, as usual, we will meet in Kumo space for a more relaxed uh, social, social get gathering. So Lorraine, if you would like to um, to start sharing your screen, you're most than welcome to start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. So, so yes, so now I guess you can see my screen. Yes, 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 perfect. Thank you very perfect. much. So, yes, so I just have to. It's a very nice slide. <clears throat> <laughs> so thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this talk and thank you for, uh, for this introduction and this opportunity uh, that NITEX gave me to present my work. So I'm Lauren Jante and uh, I think it's not the first time uh, that you hear talk about machine learning in ecology. And uh, to my knowledge, there were at least two talks about it at NITEX Colloquium. And, uh, Indeed, the machine learning is becoming more and more used in ecology as big data and repetitive uh, tasks uh, can, be, can be frequent. So, but it's still fairly new in ecology, and maybe because machine learning can require very advanced uh, math and uh, math and programming skills, I don't know. But um, for my part, I'm, I am not a real bio, uh, computer scientist. I am not, I think I am not a real biologist either, but I am more between uh, both and I'm just uh, trying to build uh, the, bridge, the bridge between these two fields, uh, as a, if I can say that. And uh, today I'm going to, to show you two examples of application of deep learning in conservation, in conservation ecology in which I have been uh, involved. So I don't know how familiar you are with deep learning and with ecology. But I tried to do um, a presentation for the non expert in deep learning and ecology. So I hope it would be clear. But if you have some questions, yes, don't hesitate to, to ask. So um, before uh, going deeper in the subject, just a quick reminder of uh, what is ecology and why do we need to monitor wildlife? So ecology is a study of organisms and how they interact. Uh, with the environment around them. So all of this will try to include all the relationship between living organism and, um, and between the habitats. So it's generally the study of how an ecosystem functions. So, but important too, uh, ecologists also study what, uh, what happens when ecosystems do not function normally. 
And I think this is why ecology is gaining popularity because with the global warming, uh, the ecosystem are being disrupted with rapid uh, change, changes. And it is very important to understand how species adapt to the rapid changes, how they're facing. So that's why we need uh, to, to, to protect, to study them, to protect them. So, and I think that is the point. So, so because you know that biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate. And uh, in, two, in 2019, the Intergovernmental Science Bio Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, so the EPBOS, uh, estimated that about 1 million animal and plant space species are now threatening with extinction. And it is mainly due, due to human activities, so the anthropogenic pressure. So that's why uh, if we want to limit this decline, we need to understand how species use their environment, interact with, uh, with it to find uh, the adapted protection measure. And uh, one way to improve our knowledge on endangered species in the environment with limited disturbance is to monitor them, to identify their behavior. And in this way, we would be able to know uh, the time budget, the population dynamic, the energetic strategy, and all of this. So the question is, uh, how do we study threatened species in the environment with limited disturbance? So for example, here you have a beautiful sunfish that may uh, be observed at the surface, uh, like, uh, like this, diver is, this diver is doing. But what happens when it decides to dive to a depth of uh, 800 meters? So uh, one solution that I've been found is to use the animal itself and involve it uh, in the monitoring by deploying onboard sensors. Um, and uh, like you can see on this picture. And indeed, the use and development of onboard sensors have revolutionized uh, the study of living organism and allowed uh, the creation of the new field as uh, biologing science. So a definition of biologic science may be investigation of phenomena in or around free-ranging organisms that are beyond the boundary, the boundary of our visibility or experience. And this is that the idea. Thanks to the deployment of onboard sensor that will continuously record uh, high resolution data on the animal and its environment, we are now able to go beyond the physical limits that the environment and the movement capacity of the animal uh, can represent to study them in their own environment. So it's very a huge revolution for the study um, of living organisms. And um, so this is what I used uh, during my PhD to study a species particularly difficult to observe in its environment, so it's a sea turtle. So I did my PhD in France at the National Center for Scientific Research, so the, the CNRS, uh, supervised by Damien Chevalier. And I tried to answer to this question, uh, automatic identification of behavior from biologists, a solution to improve our knowledge on the ecology of sea turtles. So just a quick reminder about the decline of biodiversity and the situation of sea turtles. So, there, uh, there are seven species of sea turtles in the world, and six are on the red list on the EUCN red list of threatening species. So, the EUCN is the International Union for Conservation Nature, and the only one not listed uh, is because we don't have enough data on it. So, it's a flatback turtle that you can only find in Australia. And just an example of the decline of sea turtle population. In French Guiana, uh, in South America, at Awala Yalimapo, which is a particular area where we where the seniors work. Uh, for the leatherback, so it's a big, uh, it's the biggest sea turtle, and you can see on the picture on the on the right, um, the number of nests per breeding season has dropped uh, from 50, uh, 50,000 nests in the 19. 90 to less than 200 nests in 2019, so in French Guiana. So there is a, a very huge decline in French Guiana, and we need to understand what happens. 
to identify the threat. So even if we have an idea, we have to, to, to study them and to try to know uh, what they do underwater, uh, close to the Guyana's coast, to know exactly uh, what's happened and why uh, the, the population is declining. So to do that, uh, we use so a biologar, a sensor, and uh, the sensor that we use in particular is the accelerometer. So an accelerometer, at least the one we use, uh, is a piezoelectric sensor that translates uh, the forces exerted on a mass into wave-like uh, voltage signal. So as I tried to represent with this uh, picture, so the force exerted on, on this mass will be the gravitational force, which uh, gives you uh, an information of the posture of the animal. And uh, the other one uh, would be the force of inertia that we called also dynamic acceleration that is linked uh, to the movement of the animal. So usually three accelerometers are placed on the back. So here, how you can see on the picture with the laser back. So you have ACC for acceleration, X, so it's the back to front axis, Y to the right to left axis, and Z uh, for the bottom to top axis. So you can imagine that if your total is on the back, the gravitational acceleration would then be the same on the X and the Z axis, for example, if your total is on the back, on the bottom or shift on the back. So thanks to, to that, we will have an idea of the posture and the movement uh, of the animal. And since most behaviors are defined uh, by movement and postural patterns, it becomes possible to infer them from acceleration signal. So here you have an example. Uh, you can see the signals that we can get uh, from the deployment of accelerometer on the laser back. And you can also see that is not very uh, easy to identify the behavior. Uh, from the from the signal. So if you deploy uh, the logger during several days, recording at, uh, for example, 50 uh, hertz or 20 hertz, you can have this kind of data at the end. So here you have also the pressure that gives a lot of information about uh, the diving uh, depth and the diving profile. So, um, and uh, from that, you can, I think, identify two difficulties. So the first one uh, would be to identify the behavior from the signal that can be not very obvious. And the second one is if, if you are able to understand uh, what happens on the signal, as some behavior are quite easy to identify, like swimming, breathing, resting, you will need to zoom on the, dat on the data uh, like this, so to have a slight window and then uh, slightly move the window over the time uh, to identify the behavior. So here from the window, you can see some behavior. So here it's mostly swimming, uh, here it's uh, breathing. And uh, yes, so if you want to label the entire data set, you, you definitely wouldn't want to manually label, uh, man manually label the entire data set. So that's why uh, we are going to use machine learning to do it for us. And uh, we are going to teach an algorithm to automatically identify the behavior from the time series data. So the first step uh, that we need to do that, to teach the algorithm, is to build as a training data set. So meaning uh, label, uh, we need to label uh, acceleration data with the behavior. So we called that also the validation of the signal because we, it allowed us to know exactly um, how to associate with which behavior uh, each uh, sig sig acceleration signal. So for that, we use uh, this kind of technology, which is an onboard camera combined, combined uh, with an accelerometer and death, a death sensor uh, that we deployed on Green Turtle in Martinique. So uh, as you can see on the picture. So the device is attached to the carapace uh, using four uh, suction cups. And there is a time release system that allows the remote uh, release of the device several hours later. And uh, that you can see here at the back of the device um, is a, a, an Argos uh, tag that allows us uh, to geolog geolocate the recorder when it floats on the surface after the time release system uh, drop off the, the, the camera. 
So yes, now we are going to slightly switch to from leatherback to green turtle. They are also endangered species with declining population. Uh, but we start to do this validation on green turtle in Martinique. So Martinique uh, is a, a French island in the Caribbean that you can see here. And here you have French Guiana, so not so far. But the thing is, it, it's uh, in French Guiana, the water are very muddy. So thus we couldn't see anything from the video recorder. So that's why we prefer to do that in the turquoise and warm water of Martinique. And that was very nice. And actually this population in Martinique of green turtle, which are immature green turtle, uh, face also many threats. So we also want to do what's happened in Martinique uh, to try to protect uh, the population. So we started by validating the acceleration signal with the video recorder. So we deployed the camera on uh, 37 individuals, uh, but only, uh, but completed data set, including video acceleration and depth value were only recovered by for 13 individuals. Uh, we obtained 66 hours of recordings and precisely identified 46 behavior based on the acceleration signals that we grouped into seven categories. So um, we have the swimming, gliding. So gliding is when the turtle swim, but using uh, its bios, uh, buoyancy. Uh, breathing, scratching, so when it's turtle can come to a rock uh, to scratch. Feeding, so uh, here we have um, uh, a herbivore, so they grab uh, the sea grace, resting, and other, it's all the other behaviors that couldn't be included in the six categories. So here's an example uh, of the video recording uh, to to give you an idea of what I could analyze during several hours. So I hope it works on your computer too. So I watched uh, all the 66 hours of recordings and annotate the precise start and end time of each behavior that I could uh, identify on the record video recording and uh, recordings. And thanks to that, I was able to accurately label the entire data set with the behavior as you can see on the right of the picture. So yes, um, the analysis of the video is quite a tedious work that can require a lot of time, but it is always a pleasure to dive in the intimacy of the sea turtle, as you can see here. So this was an interaction that you couldn't see very often uh, for sea turtles, so it was very a pleasure to to see that when you analyze uh, the video recordings. So then we have so our training data set uh, with all the acceleration signal uh, labeled with, uh, with the behavior. And so now um, we still have to train an algorithm to do the work I did from the video recording to automatically identify uh, the behavior from the raw acceleration and depth data. So to do that, we use a fully convolutional neural network, so the VENET. So to present the VENET, so it was originally uh, developed uh, by military and colleagues uh, for 3D biomedical uh, image segmentation to precisely identify an organ of interest in the picture. So if I'm, so if I'm, I'm, I'm correct, I think it's a prostate, uh, prostate that you can see here. So it means that for each uh, pixel of the, of, the, of the picture, so I, I know for a 3D picture, we can't say pixel, but I don't know exactly the name, so I would say pixel. So for each pixel of the picture, uh, the vignette will say yes or no, or one or zero, if the pixel belongs uh, to the organ of interest. And that is ex exactly what we want for our data, that for each group of data, um, we want the VNET uh, predict the behavior. So the VNET owns its name to its architecture that you can see here in B shape. And the thing uh, that is interesting is that there is no dense layer there it's, uh, that is normally the case in deep learning model, but the main operation is the convolution. So 
that's why we say that the Bennett is a fully convolutional neural network, network is because they mainly do a convolution operation. And so maybe for those who are not very familiar with convolution, so convolution, what is it? It's when you pass a filter uh, on, for example, a 2D uh, image that will perform a mathematical operation and bring out certain uh, characteristics of the signal. So that's that we call a feature map. So here you can see there were a different filter and according to the operation, uh, some uh, characteristic of the image would bring out. And, um, and then the training of the algorithm will determine which feature is useful uh, to identify the, the image. So in our case, we adapted the Bennett to fit with the 1D time series. So thanks to the collaboration uh, with Vincent Vigo, a professor at the University of Strasbourg. And uh, so here is the architecture of the Bennett, but adaptive for time series that we fed, if I can say that, uh, with this kind of input. So um, in order to have always the same shape of input, it corresponds to a sequence of the multi-sensor data containing all the descriptor, all the descriptor that, you, that we need. So here's the acceleration, so three axes of the acceleration and the depth. And according a fixed uh, window size, so for the C total, we, we fixed at 40 seconds. And so on this input, we will perform a several one-day convolution according to this architecture. So for a one-day convolution, it means that we just uh, a filter will pass uh, according to the time. So uh, that corresponds to the, um, to the number of feature map that you want to create. So here, so it's a fixed number that you have to, to decide that you have to find the best one. So here we fixed uh, at uh, 32. And so that means that at the bottom of the architecture here, we created 256 uh, feature maps. And if I have to simplify the Bennett, we can see, uh, we can see it in two parts. So the descending part uh, or encoder part that compresses the signal and creates multiple features. So this performing a multi-scale analysis. So here with the creation of 256 feature maps. And then we have the ascending part, the decoder, which synthesizes uh, the created features, rebuild the input shape, and identify uh, the behavior. So the meaning that at the end, so here as input, you have for each row of data, uh, the associated behavior. So that's why we, that is a, yeah, the, the very, that's why the Venet is very interesting because for each row, uh, we will have a, a behavior. So we don't, we don't need to segment our, our, our data into one second or two seconds to predict behavior. So this is very, a real improvement. So now if we look at the performance of the model, we use a validation data set from the video recording that the model have, has never seen before. And we perform the Venet on it to predict uh, the behaviors. So compared to the predict, predicted behaviors that you can see in red on the picture, um, uh, to the observed behavior from the big video recording in blue, uh, you can see uh, that the Venet predict uh, pretty well. And even uh, for the fin that we call the fin scale behavior as feeding and scratching, that are behaviors that are very hard uh, to identify. So we obtain with the Venet a global precision of uh, nine, um, 98%. So, which is nice, I guess. And uh, from that, we were able to build uh, the time budget of the individuals, so meaning the time allocated to each activity. So here you can see the time budget that we obtain uh, from the video recording and the one we obtained from the prediction uh, of the minutes. So, and they are quite similar. So, so we can see that it's a good result. And so now that we have trained the model to automatically identify the behavior of the green turtle from the biologer, we want to apply it uh, on long-term recording, so in Martinique. 
So we equipped uh, 21 individuals in Martinique with only accelerometer and depth sensor, and we deployed from five uh, from three to five days, and then we applied the VNet on the recording data, the recorded data. So here that you can see the result of the deployment. So gyroscope is another sensor that we use, uh, which gives indication about the angular velocity. And the color indicates uh, the behavior predicted by the VNet. So this worked uh, very well. And uh, for 120 hour recording, it took, uh, like, 40, it took like 42 seconds of, uh, for the VNet to predict all behavior to the hundredth uh, of a second. So it's a very nice tool, I can say. And from that, so thanks to the identification, it was possible to associate the dive profile, so that you can see here, uh, obtained from the dev, uh, to the behavior mostly expressed by the individuals uh, during the dive. So here the color represents uh, the behavior that was mostly expressed during the, the dive for one individual. And you can see, uh, for, for example, that uh, this turtle will tend to feed in the early morning. So here, 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 and early afternoon. So here it's early, early afternoon and this early afternoon. And we'll make deep dive either to rest or to swim uh, during the day. So like here or like here. And now we are very wondering why this individual made, for example, deep uh, swimming dive in the middle of the day. So what is the biological interest uh, of this dive? So new, new questions have uh, somehow emerged from this study, which uh, is uh, also good news. And uh, so all the very uh, interesting information that we can get from the identification of the behavior is the identification of the resting and feeding area. So here you have the GPS dots. Uh, because on the logger, there were also GPS. And uh, so here you can see the behaviors associated, so predicted by the VNet uh, for um, several individuals. And you can see uh, that some area are more specific to feeding uh, and other for resting. So for example, in Europe, you have an area where a green turtle seems to rest during the day, while this seems to rest during the night more to the south of the bay. So yes, yeah, so now uh, we know when they feed, when they rest, and where and where. So now we are working uh, with the marine park to try to implement uh, conservation measures as quiet, uh, quiet zone. So which would be protected areas for a certain period of time uh, to limit the disturbance of marine turtle and, and limit their interaction with human activity. But important too, while allowing the economic uh, activities of the island. So here's an example of application of deep learning and how it could help in the conservation and uh, with the work with many, um, with many other infrastructure. So obviously there are still some work to do in order to go further. We are planning to apply the Venet on the population of adult green turtle in French Guiana. So during internisting period, we would like to extend our knowledge, our method to leatherback and olive ridelet turtles, also present in French Guiana and in decline. And uh, for this, um, um, validation must be done for each species and as well as uh, specifically trained venets before application. So it's still some work. And finally, we are currently working on the web interface to visualize the data obtained uh, from the biologa associated with the, with the behavior predicted uh, by the VNet, as you can see on the right, and with the, the GPS. So thanks to the help of uh, Sebastian Geiger of the CNRS. So yeah, we would like to implement also the VNet interf interface to allow uh, all C data accelerometer users uh, to use it. But for that, obviously, uh, we have to, we need the, to, the training data set of the VNet has to be expanding from the population to increase the viability and to generalize uh, the model. So yes, we have still some work to do, but it's already uh, a good example. But um, so that was for C total during my PhD, but now uh, I'm going to jump 
in uh, other subjects, completely different, but uh, which use also much deep learning. So, so it's a subject that I've just started to work on it for my postdoc at Ames, so supervised by Emmanuel Dufault. And it's another example of application of deep learning for monitoring wildlife. But in this case, it's about passive acoustic monitoring and Heinen gibbons. So gibbons are another endangered species classified as crit critically endangered, which is the last statue before extinction. So I know my presentation may seem a bit depressing, but it is really to show um, how deep learning can help. And, uh, and that we must remain optimistic, so I don't want to depress anyone. But yes, so the gibbon are considered as the rarest primate and among the rarest mammals. And uh, that is very sad, but so according to this study, so um, hunting and habitat laws have reduced the species to a single uh, population in Bawangli National Na Na Natural Reserve in China. And they estimate that the total population size now likely exceeds uh, 30 individuals, which is a news, good news because in, two, in 2017, they estimate the population size at 50, uh, 25 individuals. So there is a, still a, a good news, even if there are still a very, there are still very few individuals. But so the gibbons, so are uh, living in the Bawangli National Natural Reserve that you can see here. So they were, so here that you can see the white dot uh, represent uh, their location. That, uh, so they were located in 2010 and 2011 in the, in the park. So since they may have sli slightly changed uh, the location, as you can guess, but it's not so easy to find them and observe them in this dense forest of the weather, and this, it can be uh, quite complicated to go there. So a solution that has been found, it is to use uh, passive acoustic monitoring. So here, that you can see uh, indicated by a number, uh, it's a position of uh, acoustic recorder deployed at different place uh, for, to record several hours. Uh, to see if we can record the call and identify the call of the gibbons and try to identify the population dynamic, their home range, and potentially how many individuals they are. So I think it's a, it's a work uh, done by a Canadian uh, team, if I remember well, from Emmanuel Dufour. So they deployed eight song meter recorders in, two, uh, in 2016. So as it was indicated uh, by the number in the previous picture. So here you have an example of the acoustic recording given by Emmanuel uh, during uh, his previous presentation. So it's not exactly the song meta SM3, but it's just to give you an idea so of, the, of the recorder that they use. So we can attach them to, a, to trees and at a certain height and program them to work out several hours over a certain period. Uh, so in this study, they were programmed uh, to record for eight hours uh, each day from the time of sunrise. And at the, uh, at the end, they collected uh, 6,000 uh, 6, hours of uh, audio recordings at a sampling rate of uh, 9,600 Hz. So it represents a huge amount of data that you then have to analyze. analyze. Sorry. So how do we analyze some data? So here's an example of audio recording from Forest in France. So um, I will try to, to, to make you listen to the, the song, but I am not sure if it would work in your computer. So I hope you have listened, you are hear that. So, so here you can hear several birds singing and uh, an audio recording. So if you open the file, it's mostly a long sequence of numbers. So with a sampling rate of 2,600 Hz, you record obviously 2,600 numbers per second. So if you plot this second, uh, this sequence of number, you get uh, you got something like that. So here is a plot of the value obtained uh, for the seconds that I made you listen. I hope you, you, could, uh, you could listen it. 
And the thing is that it's not very easy to study the data like this. So it's hard to identify the song of the different bird. So we prefer to use the spectrogram. So now uh, you have uh, the representation, you have a spectrogram, which is uh, the representation of exactly the same sequence, but in a, in a spectrogram wave, I can tell that. So I will not go into the details of the spectrogram because I'm not really an expert of in acoustic, but um, so that you can see here, so there is a one axis here that which represents time, and the other axis represents frequency, and the color indicates uh, the amplitudes of the particular frequency at a particular time. So with this representation, it is easier to visually uh, identify the different song, express a different frequency of uh, the different song. So you can mostly identify the different bird tones that you that you have listened. So here I think it's a is a song from the from the green woodpecker that you may hear uh, in the background that so you can hear like a, a bird lo laughing. So I, I can uh, make again the the song to see uh, with the spectrogram what it looks like. Sorry, Lorraine. I, I don't think that yes. we could hear the I don't think that we could hear the sound of the song. You can't hear the song? No. Even if I increase my no no, no. my I, I think you need to reshare your screen and when you share your screen, you need to click uh, share the resources. And in that case, we should be able to hear it. Share the resources? Uh, when no, when you share your so you need to stop sharing your yes. screen. And when you share, there will be a small tick on the bottom when you choose the which screen to share. Yes, but it, it's okay. I think I we just keep going. Uh, okay, okay, okay. That's and fair enough. Bad, but but okay. Uh, I, I think I can share the audio. Okay, so now it should work. Okay. <laughs> so I will do. So does it work? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so sorry for all, this, all of this. So if I show you again with the spectrogram and then with the song, you can see the song. Uh, Yes, so that's it. So you, you hear a lot of birds singing and from the spectrogram it's possible to visualize uh, the bird, uh, the, the song of the bird. So here I think it's a, it's a green um, woodpecker that you can hear uh, at the background uh, of, the, of the song that I made listen. So okay, so now uh, go back to the Hainan gibbons. So if you plot uh, the spectrogram uh, of the call, it looks like that. So the Cuban vocalization uh, made up of pulses. So here you can see, for example, uh, one pulse. It's here it's two pulses, three pulses, and the duet. So the duet is uh, when female and male sing together. And uh, so now everything works. So I'm going to try to play this song for you again <laughs> to give you an idea of the cause. Uh, and so to visual, visualize the spectrogram of long audio recordings and, um, and to see and listen at the same time, we use uh, the software Sonic Visualizer uh, to yeah, that allow us to visualize uh, the spectrogram and listen at the same time. So I hope it will work and uh, yeah, it should, it should now. <laughs> So yes, and you can see it's not very easy to identify. Um, so I found it's not very easy to hear the song. And um, yes, so 
the project. So here you see the, the, the spectrogram, you see the, the duet, but from the song it's not very easy to identify. And there are many other animals and bird song uh, that you can hear. And still you have to analyze, uh, analyze uh, 6,000 hours of audio recording. So it's not something that you want to do manually for sure. So the question is, can we use deep learning to automatically detect the cause of the gibbons? So actually it's a work, it's a question has already been answered by Emmanuel during his postdoc at Ames. And uh, so he published an article in remote something in ecology and conservation. And so in this study, he used deep learning to automatically uh, detect uh, the burn call. So he trained an algorithm, he built the training data set by labeling uh, many uh, manually labeling many window uh, with given call and non given call and train uh, an algorithm. So the algorithm is a conventional uh, neural network, so the CNNs. And here I try to represent uh, a simplified version uh, of the architecture of the VNET. So you can see uh, as the input it's uh, the spectrogram that you that you that you give. So on, uh, here for the gibbons it was 10 second windows. And so at the Venet, you have uh, two conventional, non, uh, conventional layers. So that creates the feature maps uh, of, the, of the spectrogram. And then uh, you have the fully connected layers here. And with the output, only two possible values, uh, one if the image corresponds to a given score, and zero if not. So I'm not sure if my representation is very clear, but you have to see each dot here um, in green and yellow as a value. So the yellow layers correspond to the flattened layers. So this operation consists of converting the 2D image into a 1D uh, matrix and this image by flattening. And uh, then you have the fully connected uh, layers. So each dot is a value colored so a neuron and, um, and each neuron is connected to the other are represented by this line. So I didn't uh, do all the line, but you have to think that each neuron is connected to each, uh, to each other. And this line represents also a mathematical operation uh, with a weight that will be um, activate or not according to the interest of this operation uh, while during the training uh, data set, while during the training uh, process. So yes, so here you have the, the CNN architecture. And uh, so from the, the, the work of Emmanuel, it works very well. Obviously, I have presented a very simplified version of the, meta, of the method and other architectures have been tested in this study, as well as data augmentation processes. And I invite you to read the article if you want more information of the method, develop, of the method developed. But so here that you can see, so in purple, the given score manually labeled, uh, labeled to train uh, the algorithm, and uh, in white, uh, the prediction of the CNN. So they got, uh, he got very good results, but sometimes it is possible that model wrongly predict a window of data as given call, as shown in this picture, that, that, that we call a uh, false positive uh, false positive segment. And if the number of false positive is too important, it could be very annoying. So um, it is where I'm coming. So we are now working with Emmanuel to improve the bioacoustic classifier as the one represented. And uh, we are thinking that adding contextual information as the location on, and time of recordings uh, can help to enhance the classifier. So, uh, we call this contextual information as uh, the metadata. So first result method that we have tested is that the multi-branch CNN architecture. So meaning uh, that now uh, the model would have two inputs. So the, the first one is a classic one with a spectral one and the other one which correspond to the metadata. So here the input two. And uh, so the first step that we have to convert uh, the metadata uh, like time and location in latitude and longitude into a 1D matrix that contains the information that the CNN will be able to use, concatenate uh, this information with the flattened uh, flatten layers and obtain uh, after the convolution uh, layers and see if the CNN can use this additional 
information to detect the given cause. So with the given cause uh, metadata, we first started to add uh, the, try the time information. So unfortunately, and fortunately for us, some audio recorders recorded during the night due to the programming problems. So we have uh, night files without given calls, and we train as uh, CNN on the day file with given call and also on the night file without given, given calls and given the indication of the time. So here, um, so here I'm now going to show uh, the results. So if you predict uh, over an entire night file, you obtain several false positives as in this picture, uh, um, which represents audio recordings of a night file. So in, uh, in, pink, in white box represented as a prediction from the classic CNN, and in yellow, the only prediction from the multi-branch CNN for this particular night file, uh, we got 10 false positives from the classic CNN, which not so bad because it's on one hour of recording, but still we have to work on it. And with the multi-branch CNN, we got uh, two false positives. So if we did that, we did that for several files and in general, we have like a reduction in false positive uh, of 24%. So yes, so this is very our first result. I have, I have just started my postdoc, but uh, now we are, we are to the, we will consolidate uh, in the future. So yes, of course, we want to go further and consolidate all this. So in particular, we would like to add uh, location data and see how far we can go in terms of accuracy of the location. So for that, we are working uh, now on a bell sound classifier and a data set from Zenocardo. So I don't know if you know this database. But it's a worldwide public database, database where people uh, enter the identified bird songs and indicate the date of recording and the place. So we want to test if, thanks to the loca locations and the spectrograms, the classifier is able to, to identify birds and if they are close in song but live on different continents. And this could be very interesting to generalize uh, the models. So I also present you uh, one method to add metadata to the classifier, but there are others. So we have to find the best one. And I know there is another one that I would like to try, that, that I would like to try. Uh, so I know that from the location data, they calculate the probability that the species, species is present or not at the location. And it's this probability that uh, then uh, is used by the model afterwards. So I would like to try uh, this method. And we are also interested in reducing the weight of data and models. So we have several projects on this topic. So this will have a significant, significant impact on the use of deep learning in ecology, as a heavy model and large data can be difficult to store and transmit. So the compression of data could facilitate their transmission from loggers to a retrieval center, for example. And lightweight models would facilitate their use as well by researchers or even allow the implementation in tags uh, directly. So why not? And yes, so we have also many, many of the projects. And uh, if I have to conclude, because I think it's time. So uh, to conclude, uh, is, yes, is that the deep learning is in its early stages in ecology. And there are still many things to work on to discover and, uh, and uh, to, yeah, to, to find. And uh, with always maybe this main objective of facilitating the work of researcher uh, in the realization of tasks that could be tedious and repetitive. And yes, just to, to work to improve the knowledge of species in danger of extinction to try uh, to limit the decline and protect them. So thank you everyone for your presentation. I hope that this presentation was clear and interesting. Um, so yes, of course, this work is possible thanks to many organizations and people that I would like to thank uh, in this slide. And uh, yes, of course, I would like to thank my supervisor during my PhD, Damien Chevalier, and for my and during my postdoc as well, Emmanuel Dufault. So to allow me to work on this uh, beautiful conservation project. So thank you very much. And if you have some questions, I would be 
very happy to answer it. Yeah, thank you very much, Lorraine. It was a fascinating talk. And uh, 